Many fighters have regretfully been on the receiving end of one of the most powerful upper body strikes in fighting, the overhand. In this video, we'll break down the anatomy and the biomechanics behind three different overhand strikes and the subtle differences between them. All right, the reason I'm showing you guys this first view or using this as the first view to look at is because it gives us a little bit of a unique uh, perspective. The second and third view, you're gonna see the, the overhand used as part of a combo. This is just kind of setting up for the overhand as a knockout blow, which it ended up being. This is Emmett versus Mitchell here. So the first thing I want you to notice is that step off the center line. Now, we talked about this before when we were stepping off the center line for the roundhouse kick when we analyzed that movement. We want a little bit more hip external rotation so that whenever he starts to rotate his hips here, boom, to face Mitchell, he gets a little bit more uh, room to move within that joint. Now he's facing forward, he gives a really good follow through stance here, it's almost like a lunge. Uh, all of his weight has been shifted to that front leg right there. And one thing I wish that he had done a little bit better, uh, not that he needed to because it ended in a knockout, but you'll see in, again, the later videos, his hips and his shoulders are kind of moving in the same plane. So he generates a lot of power from the hips, but that right shoulder didn't lag behind. Now, with that being said, he still does a really good job of side bending to the left uh, using muscles like the quadratus lumborum. You can't really see it here, right there when his, when his left or right leg comes up. You can tell how much he's crunching down into the right, or excuse me, down into the left with his head diving down, creating that really nice triplanar motion. But the biggest part of this I want you to notice is he takes really good advantage of the stretch shorten cycle right there. And you can tell because his elbow is way behind his body. Now just imagine if his thoracic spine had lagged a little bit longer, he could have done that even more. I had a subscriber recently ask about the stretch shorten cycle and I think I'm gonna do a whole deep dive video on that explaining like the neurophysiology and the mechanics of it. But basically the stretch shorten cycle is the eccentric elongation when a muscle is producing force but elongating the switch from the eccentric to the concentric has a phase called amortization phase and there's some neurophysiological and mechanical uh, aspects to that that we'll go over and then the concentric which is the actual movement of the body with the, or into the strike uh, in this case would be taking advantage of the stretch shortened cycle of the muscles like the anterior delt uh, and the pec major mainly there are some other muscles involved so he takes really good job there again you can see that that arm that head and the, the left lateral crunching happening at the uh, thoracic and the lumbopelvic regions of the body uh, and then it makes perfect contact well as, as good a contact as it needed to to drop mitchell so let's watch it one more time full speed and then we'll move on to the next one nice super fast And now we move to the second view. This is Taporia, and he's actually using the overhand as a part of a combo, right? So he does a left, he hits him with a left, and then he tries to come overhand. Well, he does come overhand with the, the right, but he doesn't need the other left. And I want you to show, I want to show you this because you can't really, you can't really see his leg or where he's planted, but he's already off center after he hits this left here. The big thing I want you to notice is the dissociation of the hips and the, the shoulders. Once he finishes that left, once it makes contact, he immediately starts to shift his weight to the left side, which is already off center again. So then when he starts to dive that head and crunch the, the thoracolumbar spine down, like we saw in the last view, he's already got his, the room in his hip joint to be able to do that. So he, boom, right there, he automatically starts to move his hips. Now his left shoulder actually moves a little bit along with it. But if you notice, his right shoulder stays behind. So he's, he's shifting the lumbopelvic left rotation and his thoracic spine is actually in relative, stays in relative right rotation. That shoulder girdle, uh, along with the muscles in the front that we talked about in the last view, is staying behind it like this nice isometric contraction to allow for him to take advantage of that stretch shortened cycle as he comes forward. So hips come forward, he dives his head down, crunches to the left, left rotation, of the trunk and just catches him right on the left side of his face. So one more time, he doesn't have to take that, that step off the center line because he's already off the center line. Okay, his hips are pretty much perpendicular to his opponent facing the cage. The left shoulder comes with him 
in the, at the very beginning of those rotation of the hips, but that right shoulder is pretty much facing the cage on the opposite side. And then it comes around and he doesn't even need the left after that. So we'll watch it all the way through. This is a slow-mo, so it'll be a little bit easier to see. Okay, so this is Johnson Dos Santos. Uh, I think this is a very good view to end on because it shows us one view or the view from this angle and then there's another angle that shows really well a couple of other things that I want you to see. But the biggest thing here is when, he, when he, he's, so he's stringing together a combo unlike the last view we saw, but you can tell that he's not necessarily off of the center line as he's setting this up. However, he almost creates the mechanical advantage without having to do that. And he does this Again, by externally rotating his hip, his knee, notice what his knee does. Even though we know just from the, the angle of the hips here, we can see that it's in the center of Dos Santos' legs, that knee comes out showing us that he's externally rotating that hip, creating a lot of mechanical advantage for him, not only in the space of his left hip, so that that left rotation can happen at the lumbopelvic region, but just a mechanical advantage of stepping off the center line, which we know helps, especially when we're throwing kicks. So he externally rotates his hips, and I know it's really quick and hard to see here, we'll see it better than the other one, but his hips switch really quickly. So you can see the left side bending, the thoracolumbar spine, and as he dives his head down and rotates that entire trunk, his left shoulder is behind. It's very hard to see here, uh, but then he makes contact with Dos Santos' face. And you know I have to mention this if we look up here. Look how forceful of a rotational moment that is. So again, if you watch the, knock, the physiology of a knockout video, and you hear me talk about this a lot when we talk about knockout blows, the recoil from that is what we think causes that axonal damage acutely and causes that loss of consciousness. So. left, slip, left, creates the illusion or gets the same mechanical advantage of stepping off the center line but externally rotating his hips or his left hip, creating the, the ability for that moment to happen around the left, or excuse me, the lumbopelvic spine and then create that whipping motion through. Now, as we go to the next view, it shows really well the stretch shortening cycle and the hip shoulder dissociation. So. Look at, look at the angle of the shoulders and the hips here. So that really quick switch, if you were to take an imaginary line and draw it through both of the, the hip bones or the femur, the femoral head, either side of his body, it would pretty much be coming straight at us. And if you took a, an imaginary line and drew, drew it through straight, straight through both of his shoulders, they'd be at kind of an, uh, like about a 45 degree angle, maybe a 30 to 45 degree angle. That dissociation is what creates the environment for the ability to take advantage of that stretch shorten cycle here at the muscles that horizontally adduct the shoulder, uh, the, the anterior delt and pec major. So as he switches his hips, it creates tension here. So it's, it's basically an, uh, an eccentric elongation, albeit very short in time, that amortization phase, the switch from the eccentric to the concentric, and then the concentric as he brings it around. That along with the right, or the, excuse me, the left thoracolumbar side bending, and then the rotation of the thoracolumbar, or excuse me, of the, the trunk in general, and then using his head as a guide and diving down to create even more momentum. And then we already talked about that quick rotation. So I'm just gonna let you watch it one more time. He's so quick that it's, it's hard to even catch when he's slowing down. So click play here. Hopefully now you have a little bit more of an understanding and appreciation of the overhand than you did before. Leave me some comments down below about what you may want to see next. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.